Welcome to the What You Next podcast. In this podcast, your host, Lori Amin, will interview published authors to chat about their work, journey to getting published, and their book recommendations. If you share a passion for books and are always looking for your next read, then join us. Welcome to the What You Next podcast. Today's guest is Sue Fishman. So is a published author on multiple books. Her latest is Invisible as Air, as she tackles the opioid crisis. In this episode, we chat about the, her writing process, we dive into her book, and finally we get around book recommendations. Now let's get to the show. Hi, so Welcome to the Watch Read Next podcast. Hi, Laura. Thank you for having me. So happy to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so I currently live in Decatur, Georgia. I was in the book publishing industry in New York for 13 years. Mm. I moved here in 2011. Um, and I got my writing career started while I was agenting for a small agency, a boutique agency in New York. Um, I write here, I teach the Decatur Writer Studio, at which I'm also the director. And I also teach in Emory Continuing Education, and I am the mom of two small boys. Oh my gosh, that's great. That's great to hear. So what inspired you to become a writer? Was it working in publishing, or was it a dream that you had before working in publishing? It really, writing was the only thing that I was very confident. Um, I was confident in my ability to write, and I, I loved to write from a very young age. And that was due to my parents, um, my father uh, instilled the writing structure to me. And my mm-hmm. mother had me at the library since before I could walk. Mm. That's amazing. So when Thanks. you're a reader, so I'm assuming you're a reader too. So. Oh yeah. Very avid reader when um, I can. Now it's harder, <laughs> but I love, love, love to read. Yeah, I can imagine. It's definitely, you know, life gets into a way. So oh, I'm getting yeah. to do writing, getting to do work, getting to be a mother, just yeah. get everything gets in the way. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So you're a published author. What was your journey like to get your first book published? My journey is um, very different than most. So mm-hmm. I s- I majored in English in college, and then I went on to New York and worked in the publishing industry, always wanting to write, but never really having the willpower to make it work. And then eventually I reconnected with my uh, self-discipline, largely through the New York Marathon, which I Mm -hmm. entered the lottery expecting not to be accepted, and unfortunately was. (laughs) Oh my gosh. <laughs> but in training for that, I actually, I was able to reconnect with what true discipline means. Mm-hmm. And um, after that, I started asking around, you know, a lot of friends of mine in the industry wrote on the side, ghostwriting, mm-hmm. small jobs. And a friend of mine who had that career in spades, her plate was too full. So mm-hmm. she asked me if I wanted to take on two small projects. Mm-hmm. Um they were for the brats. I don't know if you know the brats. They're kind yeah. of like, a, yeah. <laughs> they were two novel, like mystery novellas. And mm-hmm. I was extremely excited to do it. And it taught me a lot about plotting, actually. I yeah. began as a dialogue heavy, character driven writer, but plotting a mystery, even at that level, is no mm-hmm. joke. Mm-hmm. So after that, I, as I said, I was an agent. I went to a lot of conferences as an agent. I met a wonderful editor. And my first book, Balancing Acts, was about a group of women in Brooklyn in a yoga class who reconnect. Um, And the idea for that book actually came out of a brainstorming meeting at HarperCollins. And she called me and said, would you like to try, you know, take a stab at this? And of course, I jumped at the chance. Um, And I presented four characters and put them in Brooklyn instead of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And um, they were into it. And so my first book deal was born out of a brainstorming session at an editorial meeting. And from there, I was able to write the books that I wrote completely on my own without Mm -hmm. any um, guidance. Oh, Mm -hmm. my gosh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, So when did you run the marathon? I really, I can even remember the year now, <laughs> oh 2003, 2000, oh my, yeah, oh I think so. I was in my mid twenties. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did. And it was an incredible experience. You know, it's, 
it's a great honor and unbelievable to cross the finish line when you start out as someone who can barely go five miles. So (laughs) it's a huge achievement. I have not run since. (laughs) Yeah. It's a huge achievement to take on. It's, it's, it's such, it's such a great luck that you got the lottery, you know? Right. Right. And it was exactly what I needed. I need, it was time for me to stop being a silly 20 year old and to focus on what I really wanted. Yeah, that's amazing. So let's talk about your writing. Do you follow an outline or do you see where the story leads you? I'm very, very structured. So I craft a very lengthy synopsis. Mm -hmm. Then I edit it down. And Mm -hmm. then I have an outline that inevitably changes as I get to know the characters better and the story evolves on its own. But I always begin with an outline as my Mm -hmm. roadmap. Because without mm. that roadmap, for me, mm. writing a novel is like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. It's just, yeah. you know, you, you could go so many different ways. And so a map is very helpful. What's your favorite thing about writing? My favorite thing about writing is getting, creating and getting to know the characters. Mm. Um, there's so much richness in people and by writing them I discover things about them that weren't part of my original plan Mm. and that's because they take on a life of their own and that's always really invigorating for me because I'm such a planner it's Mm -hmm. a reminder that this is art and I am grateful to be a part of that process. Mm, that's amazing. And I love that your books are character-driven novels, which you dive into the characters as opposed to just plot-driven where, you know, the action leads you. Um, there was Thank some you. richness about the characters that, you know, they, they made it unique for it. Thank you. So um, do you share your work along the way or do you wait to complete a father to read? No, I'm a total wimp. I okay. <laughs> I really work by myself. I'm a big believer of too many cooks in the kitchen. So I write the first draft. It's always inevitably terrible. Mm-hmm. And every writer should know that and expect that. And yeah. then I take a breath, move away from it and come back. And then I really go in and slash and burn the unnecessary parts so that the first draft that I turn in is as polished as I can possibly make it. Okay, that sounds good. So let's talk about Invisible as Air. This book dives into the loss of a child and how it affected the family, along with other things like addiction, um, growing up, you know, and whatnot. Who inspired to write this book? So I was initially inspired by the oxycodone epidemic here. I you know, it's ravaging the country Mm -hmm. and it's affecting people from all walks of life, of all genders, of all races. Um, And I wanted to write about a woman who wasn't your typical drug addict Mm -hmm. and describe what it was like for her to, and why she chooses these drugs as a crutch. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was my jumping off point. And then I needed to figure out what it was that made these drugs so seductive for her Mm -hmm. and repressed grief um, Mm -hmm. and a family divided, plus just an overburdened life, you know, working mom, taking care of everything, this whole, you know, conception of having to lean into the point of falling in on your face. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I related to that. So the idea of an escape, uh, is certainly has occurred to me more than once. Mm. Yeah. So, how much research did you conduct to get into the mindset of an opioid addict, um, well, which is I, unique to other addictions? Right. Um, I read a lot about it. I and to be honest with you, personally, you know, I only when I was after the birth of my two sons, I was prescribed. Um, Percocet uh, for the pain and I took them as prescribed and Mm -hmm. found them to be absolutely (laughs) amazing Mm -hmm. and I was I could absolutely see how they could become an addiction Um, all the things that so 
that Sylvie claims they do, Mm -hmm. they do. They calm you down. They make you nicer. You have patience Mm -hmm. because, you know, you're on, you're on a drug. You're on an opioid that's changing the chemistry of your brain. So I really just drew from that and the stories that I'd read. That's great. Yeah. I saw, I noticed, I work actually in my day job. I work, um, I'm investigating providers who do opioid overprescribing. So it's interesting oh, wow. to see. So it's interesting to see, you know, the life of the person who's addicted to it. Um, yeah. So, so it was just an interesting, you know, to see the process of it. And I grew up in, in child and alcoholic, so I know what the addiction looks like. And it was oh, interesting wow. to see the whole process of the family dynamics and how it changes when one parent is an addict. You know, seeing Teddy, right. the parent, you know, keeping yeah. the secrets, just holding out together. That felt very real. So you could relate to his perspective. Yeah, yeah oh. I could relate to Teddy's perspective a lot. Um, I'm so glad. Yeah. And I'm sorry that you had to go through that. It's okay. You know, I got the therapy and I've gone through all the different groups and all the different resources that are available to get through it. But you know, it's unique to see it as a child, you know, when you're 9, 10, 12, 13, you know, seeing this big change and then not knowing how to go about and becoming, somewhat becoming the parent to your parents. Right, right. It's incredibly heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of times parents are completely oblivious to the intuitive nature of their children. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's, it's interesting. You know, both parents did not know that they were that Teddy was keeping the secrets, and yet when they, when they were confronted, they were like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." <laughs> right, know, right, because like, they're so self involved. Yeah, they didn't they didn't get it that you know Sylvie had the opioid addiction, and then Paul was with the overspending and the emotional right. Over. Like, right, they're all trying to fill this void that grief has created. Um, but nothing, no material good, yeah. no drug can soothe that void. Um, it has to be dealt with in a therapeutic environment and it has to be done on a real, true, honest timeline. I mean, mm-hmm. grief is individual to every person. Yeah. I think that was a, the biggest, the biggest arc was about grief, about the loss of Delilah and the whole process, how they all come about it, you mm-hmm. know, seeing Seeing Sylvie just repress it, Paul trying to figure it out at the same time, trying to just keep going with his life. And Teddy was the one who had the guts to say, you know, I'm just going to confront the, confront it and just going to go show up and do this prep. Right. I fell in love with him. I really yeah. did. Yeah. He was a great character. Um, Thank you. And it was definitely accurate how to deal with a, ch- a child, an addict and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um so let's talk about Paul. What is hard to write his character at that point in life where he's just, he has a broken ankle, he's trying to figure things out, um, mm-hmm. as opposed to be in the midst of the emotional relationship or the overspending? He was probably my hardest character to realize. I knew who Sylvie was. I knew who Teddy was. This was the first time I had written from an adult male perspective. Okay. Um, but... You know, I, in my first draft, I had created all of these secondary characters for him mm-hmm. in the classic attempt to somehow make him more interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and when I went back to edit the first draft, I realized that they were unnecessary um, and I was avoiding the real work that I needed to do. Mm-hmm. So I, I needed to give him his own story and I needed to give him his way through grief and how he Mm -hmm. was dealing in an unhealthy way because he couldn't be perfect either. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, you know, he was always going to be this kind of wannabe athlete. And Mm -hmm. I just thought this buying and buying and buying Mm -hmm. um, to fill that void seemed to make sense for him. Mm -hmm. And he's also very hurt by the fact that his wife has checked out, but he also unfairly blames her for his own lack of willingness to address his grief in a healthy manner. Um, Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times in couples, 
we have a tendency to blame our partners if we're not emotionally sound Mm -hmm. when the truth is that work can be done on your own Mm -hmm. um, and you can bring your partner in if you need to. Um, But it was a convenient excuse for him. Sylvie's own refusal. Yeah. It felt like it was a cop out. Like he was like, well, then I'm just going to be a triathlete or I'm just going to overrun or I'm going to talk to this this woman, but I'm not going to engage in a relationship. Right. Right. I'm innocent of everything. You're the one who screwed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it made it an interesting dynamic in the marriage where both parties were unhappy. At the same time, they were not willing to work on the relationship or work on the the issues that were on the surface. Right. So in your mind as an author, what happens after Sylvie comes back from rehab? What would would you imagine would have happened? I think that realistically, I think that she'll probably relapse. Yeah. Um, I think that after that relapse, she'll get serious about Mm -hmm. what she has to do, whether or not her marriage can withstand that therapy remains Mm -hmm. to be seen. I hope it does for them. I do think they love each other, but I think that being shaken by the tragedy of the stillbirth of their daughter And the time that elapsed in which they didn't speak about it will ultimately Mm -hmm. have repercussions for both of them. Yeah. Thank you so much for writing this book. It's so timely at this point, you know, in 2019, where the opioid addiction is so rapid. Um, So thank you for bringing this up to a timely current event, you know. Oh, thank you. So... Now let's get to a round of book recommendations. This is an opportunity for you to share with our audience what they should read next. So what is your favorite genre? I'm a big fan of literary fiction, if I'm reading on my own. That's great. Who's your favorite author? So it's a toss-up um, between Elizabeth Strout, Ann Patchett, Donna Tart, Jeffrey Eugenides, and Jhumpa Lahiri oh, at this awesome. point. That's awesome. There's a couple of couple, a couple of books coming out for a few of those authors. I know. I read, um, I got an early, I got to read the ARC of the next Olive Kittredge, and it's incredible. Oh, that's so great to hear. I saw it at yeah. BA, so that's great. Yeah, it was. I was very lucky. Oh, that's great. What are your top three favorite books of all time? Okay, so this is tough, but I think that Rebecca, The -hmm. Secret History, and Olive Kittredge. Ooh, I love it. I read (laughs) Rebecca, and it's a great thriller. Yeah, I read that as a kid. It was like my first real adult book, and I just remember being completely mesmerized by it. Yeah, I read a few retellings, and it's still, it's just as good as the first book, uh, the original book, but I have to say, Mm -hmm. the original book, Santa and its own. You know, hundred. Oh yeah, it blew me away. I think I was eight. <laughs> it blew me away. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, what has been a book that you read this year that you love? Anything is possible by Elizabeth Strout. Ooh, I love it. It's beautiful. Tell, tell us where we can find you online. You can find me. I have a website, uh, net. I'm on Twitter at at zofishman76. And I have an author Facebook page, just so Fishman. Thank you so for being in the show. Laura, thank you so much for the opportunity. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so for a great interview. For show notes and other books mentioned in this podcast, please visit whatwenextblog.com. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another author interview. Have a great week.